a radio thing? Were we both on a radio thing once? We did Bob Martin. Yes. Hello, I'm I'm talking to Tracy Ann Oberman. Um, you, now we go back quite a way. Um, we've not been in each other's pockets over the years. It, it's fair to say. We're but not intimate, no. No, 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 no. But no. enough that we could talk if we met. I don't rule it out. But can you say that in 2023, even as a joke? What? Don't rule it out. You said we've not been intimate. I said don't rule it oh. out. <laughs> I was being flirtatious. I, I, I was being was flirtatious. Li- I, I think you can say it. Yeah. Yeah. Hang on. I'm just gonna just call the daily. Oh, no. um, you done? can say that we were. I were we intimate? No. No. no of course no, we were. Really were we were we intimate? No. Don't rule it out. I love it. Oh, we, no, we were never intimate. No. Don't forget, you can hear the full-length, longer version wherever you get your podcasts. No, we've worked together a few times, though. Yeah. Actress. Where do you stand on that? Love it. You prefer actor? I reclaim actress, Rob, because Dorothy Parker said, scratch an actor and you get an actress. So, in my opinion, <laughs> everyone is an actress. I've never heard that. Yeah. I scratch love that. Scratch an actor and you get an actress. Everyone's an actress. All right. Okay, good. Um, uh, activist. Yes. 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 An actorvist. Yes. That's a, yes, but I do. But not an actuary. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've never understood what an actor is. No, a little bit of an activist in yeah. that as the as the times that I felt so strongly about things and I looked around expecting the grown-ups to speak out and no grown-ups yeah. did, yeah. I ended up sort of feeling that like I had to speak out myself. Mm. And mm. the next thing you know is you suddenly become a sort of spokesperson for things that feel so you feel so strongly about and others feel strongly too. And you get a battering on social media. Sometimes I get a battering, but I've had a lot more love than battering, and that's what's been so lovely, is that the allies... Courage calls to courage everywhere, Rob. I really believe that. And I think that when you speak out because you feel you haven't got a choice and because it's your truth, you end up bringing a lot more allies than you do hate. And it's made me very strong. I'm loving this, and Mm -hmm. we've only just started. (laughs) The Merchant of Venice is the primary reason why you have chosen to spend time with us. Because this is a business, show business is a business, and you are about to perform in The Merchant of Venice. 1936. 1936, so we'll explain all this, but the biggest twist in it is that Shylock, a role normally associated with a male gender, is in this instance, I'm doing Peter Cook in the Tarzan sketch, you see, (laughs) in this instance is being played by a lady of the female gender. It's true. Discuss. Um, Oh, it's like an A-level question. Mm. Well, I am playing the first significant female Shylock in a production that I've been working on for many years. It's called The Merchant of Venice, 1936. I hate this play. I've always hated The Merchant of Venice. It's a very difficult play. Um, Why do you hate it? Because it, I remember doing it at school. Mm-hmm. It was not taught very well. Mm-hmm. And I, being the only Jewish girl in the class, I was playing Shylock. You were and the only Jewish girl in, in your class? In that class, yes. Um, and afterwards, in the in the um, in the break time, everybody was running around going, "My duck, it's my daughter," and sort of rubbing their hands together. And the whole kind of trope about a vicious, vengeful, money grabbing mm. Jew mm. who has to be brought down by church and state at the end is not an, an easy play, I think, mm. for a lot of people to watch. It's a very difficult play, and I always wanted to reclaim it. I wonder what would happen if you took Shylock and this very obsessive relationship with his daughter, and you turned it into a single mother. I based her very much on my great grandma who came over in 1904 from the pogroms in, I would say, in Fiddler on the Roof, in a, in, mm. the, in the Pale of Settlements. She was as tough as nails. My other great... I had another great aunt called Machine Gun Molly. I had another one called... The men were all terrified of her. I had another, again, a great aunt um, in the East End called Sarah Portugal. She smoked a pipe. She wore a slash of red lipstick. These matriarchs were as tough as nails. And I thought it would be very interesting to take The Merchant of Venice and take that character, Shylock, and turn it into one of those women that had come over literally from the hovels of... of Russia, peasant stock, were now in the east end of London and had come face to face with the fascism of Oswald Mosley at the Battle of Cable Street. And that's where all my family ended up. So it's a really interesting um, taking of that play and putting it into a slightly new context. So it's set at that time? Yes, set in 1936. The Venetian aristocracy are now um, Oswald Mosley, uh, upper class fascists. Mm. Our Portia is a slightly better educated Diana Mitford. Because right. I never knew that Oswald Mosley, when he married Diana Mitford, oh, those glorious Mitford sisters, got married at Goebbels's house with Hitler as a witness. I didn't know that. And Hitler taught Mosley the entire playbook of whipping up Jewish hatred in order to bring working class minorities with him to get power. And he had this private arm 
army. And when he did come down to the Battle of Cable Street, all the other sort of minority, um, my grandmother and great-grandmother always said the Irish working-class neighbours, the small Afro-Caribbean community, the dockers, the unionists, everyone stood together and said, well, if you come for the Jews, you come for us all, yeah. you shall not pass. Yeah. And they sort of yeah. stood together and were like ordinary heroes. So this is a civil rights moment as well that we acknowledge in the play. So wh where did, so when did this begin for you then, this idea of doing this play like this? I I went to see the all-female Julius Caesar. Uh -huh. I've never liked that play and it really made sense to me and I thought, oh, it isn't, you can have a gender switch. Um, am I allowed to say that? You can have a gender switch for a play and it can enhance it. And I started to work on it with the director, Bridget Larmore, and then the RSC got involved and Watford Palace Home Theatre and we workshopped it and workshopped it. And it just, it just kind of works and it's done really well. So it's about to open at the Royal Shakespeare Company. And then it's going on a nationwide tour, Rob. It's going to York, it's going to Malvern, it's going to, coming into Wilton's on Cable Street. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, wow. it's, it's exciting going wow. to um, oh, just all over Cardiff. But all the places that have got a real interesting history and also a history of immigrants yeah. and immigration, because it's not just a play about Jews, it's a play mm. about othering. Of course, and play. Yeah. Is this the sort of light-hearted stuff you have on this podcast? Th this is funnier than anything we've ever done. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I've seen The Merchant of Venice on stage twice. Go on. First with Dustin Hoffman. Oh, wow. And then, uh, years later, I went to Broadway, uh, not in a professional capacity. <laughs> uh, of course, when I, when I was on Broadway, you see, for an evening, and I saw Al Pacino <laughs> wow. playing Shylock. Very big hands. Has he? Yes, you surprisingly really... large, no. And out of the two productions, which one spoke to you the most? Well, I would say the Pacino one. I had better seats. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, well, you know. That's important. It's very Listen, important. We, we, can, we can laugh, but yeah. uh, for, for, the, for the one uh, with the Hoffman, we were up in the gods when we went to see... Uh, Pacino, I was about five rows from the front. Oh, it makes a huge... Constantly looking at his hands. <laughs> the, what, what are your hands like? Let me see. Because it said to me that to be a good Shiloh, you've got to have massive hands. No, and you've got lovely... Tiny can I say ladylike hands? Well, they're not, actually. They're like pig farmer hands. So, oh, a um, lady pig farmer. Lady pig farmer. Um, yeah. I, I don't... <laughs> Sorry? What? I don't think you need anything to play with a good old Shylock. But you, you hear people turning around going, oh, you're going to play it with a beard? You're going to play it with a nose? It's like, no, actually. Yeah. The, the character sort of speaks for itself. The, the, the sexiest words on our, about our production is two hours with an interval. Oh, we've hit on something there. The, 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 the dreadful reality as one gets older, nothing is more appealing than a play that doesn't last that long. Two hours with an interval, we've cut all the fat off it. It's sexy, it's political, it really moves at a pace and it, it, it's, uh, it's got quite a good feel-good ending. It's, it's a sexy bit of theatre, it works. I want to see it. I think you should come. I want to see will it. Will you come? Uh, yes. I think you love it. Right. And my hands will grip you. Would you would you maybe from the performance I come to wear large gloves, <laughs> just as a little nod to Al Pacino? <laughs> yes. When he did it, he went, "Oh, does a Jew not have? Ah, uh, if you tickle him, does he not <laughs> laugh?" Do you do that speech like that? No, but I'm getting... So Why didn't I meet you before rehearsal started? Oh, he's, oh. oh. And there was a oh. lot of spittle. Oh, there was a, in the film version, there was a lot of he's, spittle. Well, all of them were. Yes, I mean, was. this was pre-COVID. If this had happened after COVID, the audience would have left. No. I've never seen so much saliva. It was like singing in the, the rain, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With that water, I know. The you would, that, you'd know, because he did a film version of it as well. Was that the same in the so film? So much spittle. Oh, I mean, I, it is possible to do it without the spittle. Yeah. But the I, I, hands is a great idea. Giant prosthetic hands. Remember Kenny Everett used to do yes. that? Uh, remember that? I could do a Bradley Cooper with my hands. Massive put on hands. How topical can this podcast be? Look you at brought me. up See? Bradley Cooper's portrayal of Bernstein. Bernstein? Bernstein? Bernstein, Bernstein. Ah, you say potato, potato I, I say, say potato. Hey, what do I care? What do I do? I'm doing Jackie Mason. I like to do this occasionally. Why would the Jew would not care? A Gentile would not know. Why would he care? Why would I not do it? Is he still alive? No, he's dead. When did he die? When he stopped breathing. Oh, Oliver Shalom. Oh, oh, sorry for that. Funny, funny, uh, funny man. Funny, funny, funny man. Loved him. Uh, why should the, uh, he goes, uh, I don't know why, why would a Jew buy a boat? The Jew does not want to be on a boat. The Jew buys a boat. He takes his friend down to the dock. There's the boat. Let's eat. <laughs> so true. Well, the Jew always wants his clothing to have a label. It's got to have a label. When two Jews meet, they spend the first five minutes reading. <laughs> 
And the thing about the theatre, you eat in. When the Jews go oh, to the theatre, yeah, you eat in. Yeah, you eat in. Yeah, you eat in. Where are we yeah. going to eat? Have you got eaten? And then the non-Jews come. They go, have you drunk? Have you had a drink? <laughs> now, you see, Rob is allowed to do this because I'm here with That's him. That's crossed my mind you as see? I was doing all that. <laughs> I'm going to, yeah, literally, I'm the fig leaf that makes this absolutely acceptable. Oh, help me. <laughs> I'm, I'm you know, you know, help me, Obi-Wan. Yeah, help me, Tracy Ann. Help me, Tracy Ann. You're my, my only nickname. hope. Please. I'm Obi-Wan Kenobi. Please. I am. Hang on. Here's the fig leaf, and you're all right. <sighs> It's a minefield now, Rob. How do you do this podcast? Well, You we're... don't have young people on, do you? Oh, certainly not. You can't have young people on. No, and I certainly don't want them listening. <laughs> the last thing I want... You're dressed now. I know, it's really like... Is that nightwear? What, you, is this, is that, what is this, lingerie? <laughs> I feel like I'm in a scene of toast... toast uh, <laughs> of London. This is it's what you dress so like in that. It's so hot in here. I've literally stripped off to my pink negligee. I yeah. think the evening suit was a bit much, but... No, this is this is video and... Uh, so people can see. If they're watching us on YouTube, You're they'll joking. know. You're joking. Nobody told me this was on, on... Well, what do you think all these cameras are for? I just thought it was for your own vanity to watch it back. Honestly, I can't... Is this on video? Yes. Oh, for fuck's <laughs> I had to put more makeup on and I'm putting my jacket back on now. Uh, the, the toast came up there. <gasps> now yes. For, well, that's such a great show. Oh, I know. It's a great show. So Matt Berry. Yes. Um, Has he been on here yet? No, no, he hasn't. Have you asked him? Um, I, don't, I don't know if we have, actually. I'd love to have him on. I know. Um, tell me about that show. Has, mm. has it finished now, or will well, it come back? Well, it's a different back? beast now. Now it's called Toast from Toast in Tinseltown. But that was just a one-off series, well, wasn't who, it? Well, who knows? That's because it moved to the BBC and that they sort of changed the format. I didn't slightly. know yes, that. It's it moved was, to the BBC. Well, that's when Toast of Tinseltown moved to the BBC. Why did it leave Channel 4? Don't ask me the grown-up questions, uh, Don't Rob. tell me I'm they didn't. I'm just a meat be... puppet for hire. Um, uh, Toast of London. So I remember getting the script for that and yeah. reading it, and it was... Um, it was I, I was like... Mrs. Purchase is taken from behind in a negligee while smoking a cigarette. <laughs> to next page. Mrs. Purchase still being taken from behind while smoking a cigarette. And I ran my agent and went, I'm not doing this. Did said, you what seriously? Is this? I said, Did what you is really? this? I said, who is Matt Berry? And no, I'm not doing this. This is going to hang around. On my, I've just had a young daughter. Yeah. Little did I know it was going to be the most fun on any job I've ever yeah. had. Yeah. It was like a post-feminist sort of woman that had never had an orgasm. Right. Yeah. That just literally, unless she's charging for it, she can't enjoy sex. It's she's, glorious. She's a brilliant character. And, it's got, and it, the whole show has, has so much its own voice and... It's just great, and the, your your scenes are reminiscent of. Do you remember you'd in the Sweeney and Minder <laughs> Terry would pop yeah. in and Minder, and he'd have sex on a Tuesday yes. afternoon, and it was just. Yeah, that's what happens. So Matt and Arthur, they wrote this sort of hinterland of sort of the this sort of acting community that could have been any time between like the late sixties mm. to some dystopian future. It just mm. works, mm -hmm. but it's got such a threat. You can't place it, but it's got it's got such um, a sort of historic feel, very seventies oh, naughty feel. It's, it's brilliant, accurate, so it's accurate. accurate. Now you and I are stalwarts of the voiceover world, right? So. All his stuff oh, in you... the voiceover studio, and if you haven't seen or watched this, you you must, uh, you probably have. I mean, people do, but Toast of London, the stuff when he's doing the voiceovers, again, it's it's crazy, but it's so accurate. So accurate. I mean, you know, can you hear me, Clem Fandango? I can. When he has to say the word yes, like 150 mm. times, mm. and then the mm. dubbing of the sex scenes. Mm. I mean, the whole mm. thing is genius yeah. because, as with all comedy, it has to be believable. Mm -hmm. You can have, you know, the, the comedy just has mm. to be, the, the rules of the world have to be believable. But absolutely, you can't do a voiceover now. Although, don't you find that so many of them are done at home now? I do all mine at home at now. Zoom. I mean, I simply won't come into town now. It's a different world, isn't it? It a is. Scramble. Right, that, that's where Scramble is the studio used yeah. in the show, isn't it? In and Toast. Yes. Yeah, I've sat in that studio. So many a time. Okay, so your first reaction was, Rah. so what convinced you then to do it? Um, and then we had a week's rehearsal. I mean, who has a rehearsal? Yeah. And it was literally just me, Matt and um, Harry Peacock in a room with, with me sort of saying, well, so right, I'll get on all fours at this point and thinking, I'm never going to do this. I'll never get a series. What is this weirdness? And because you, you didn't see the other people's parts as well yeah. and then um watching the pilot it was absolutely hilarious mm. and it did get a series mm. and on it went yeah. but matt yeah. and arthur did create a genius character in a brilliant world because there were so many truths lots of other things i'm not a big eastenders person right i i, I don't follow eastenders but i know for a period big part of your life and presumably one of the biggest audiences you've had. 
Well, surprisingly, it was only 18 months of my life, but I was in 138 out of 142 episodes in the first year. And the second year, I was in about 52 episodes out of half a year. So I was pretty much like so ran that big show. Big workload then in it that was period. Massive. Uh, so Chrissy Watts was started off being a certain character. I mean, I went for the audition for that. Yeah. Um, and I was the only person I'd never heard of on that list. And oh. I was like, ooh. And I didn't know what the part was. It was all shrouded in secrecy. And then I got through to the recall. And again, I went down and I was thinking, I thought I was going up for a policeman or Ian Beale's next wife. And they said, <laughs> just to let you know, when we go in, as I went past all the A-listers that were up for this, there were like six of us. And I was like, who am I? And they said, you're going to be meeting Leslie Grantham on the set of The Queen Vic. And I walked in and he went, oh, hello, are you the girl that does... I can't do impressions like you, you'll have to do it. As Leslie, he said... Um, are you the girl that does the voiceovers? Say it. Ah. Say it. Well, I, I can't. I mean, you can. You, I can't remember what he, what did he say. You he just there. sound like you've smoked oh, a thousand. Sorry, are you yeah. the girl that does the voiceovers? And I said, yes. Are you the man that's been dead for fifteen years? Because his character yeah, had been yeah, dead fifteen yeah, years. Yeah. Uh, you and could have said several things. Several to things. To him, okay. And the joke of it was that I did the scenes with him, being the only person I'd never heard of. But they kept, and I love this because it's the campus thing I've ever heard. They kept the cameras rolling. And he was very like, are you going to do it like that? Are you going to do it like that? And I said, well, are you going to do it like that? And Did I said, you? yeah, Good really you. answer back. Good and then they you. said, what was so interesting, why we cast you, was that if Angie and Den were like Liz Taylor and Richard Burton, you and Den's, you and Leslie's relationship was like Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. And I literally had to stop myself from literally went, oh, oh. And then saw that they were being serious and went, oh, right, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's funny. Isn't that funny? And oh, I was like, right, funny. OK. And they were like, so, we, you know, we love that, 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 that chemistry that you had. I went from Ken Branner at the National Literary within three weeks to Den. At the, uh, I literally sat down on my first day in the makeup chair and I sort of thought, this is what actors do. And I sort of yeah. went, oh, hello, where do you live? I said to one of the actors, why, why is she asking me where I live? Why is she asking me where I live? Are you going to sell a story on me? Sell a no. story to who? What are they talking about? It was the most paranoid place. Literally, you'd be talking to people and they'd be going like this under the table. I swear to you. And I was like, what are you doing, oh, X actor? Wow. And they were going, somebody bugs us. And it was like, nobody's bugging you. You're all bonkers. Cut to a few years later, mm. everybody was mm. bugging you. It was all the hacking. So you and I, <laughs> you and I appeared together. Yes. Years well, the first time because we had a little chat before we started was in a Michael Barrymore connects us. Yes, he does. Do explain. We he did a series. We did a series called, which, which will never see the light of day again, sadly. Um, but it was called Bob Martin, yes, and it was. was a bit like Larry, Larry Sanders. Sanders. It was like yeah. an English version of Larry Sanders about a troubled game show host mm -hmm. played by a troubled game show host and the team who work around him to make the game show. Happen. And I was Beverly, the celebrity booker, and Keith Allen was in it, and Dennis Lawson, and people came in and played themselves, and you came in to play Rob Bright. No, you? no, it was before I would. No, no, I played. I played a contestant oh. on the quiz oh. in the same episode as Danny Bear, who I think was playing herself. Oh, yeah. to me, you were always Rob Bright. No, no, this was. I was playing a part, and it was. It was when we'd made the the pilot of Marion and Jeff, but it hadn't gone out. I remember him talking about Marion and Jeff. And you? I remember Marion Jeff and the absolute, because knowing you from around the scene and mm. sort of like we were all youngsters together and you were always brilliant, but this Marion and Jeff just exploded and you just became a legend. I mean, it was incredible. <laughs> I remember slightly overemphasizing it. No, it was amazing. Then, a couple of years later, we did a special. You played Marion, who we never see in the series. But it was very interesting. It was all shot from what they call found footage, That's wasn't it? That's right. All the camcorders are at this at this event. So so we did that together. And Steve was in it. C Steve Coogan. Whatever happened, happened to, to him. him. <sighs> he did a little travel show called The Trip or something, I think. He just oh, travelled. Oh, I heard that was awful. Awful. Oh, I nobody would. I mean, who watches that? I mean, why? Why would you? But you have a fantastic career. Uh, do you know? I've I I never my and dad. It's never been better. I would say. I think it's got better. I think yeah, it's I, I found I agree, a voice because yeah. I'm writing. You know, I write a lot. I write yeah. a lot of plays, and you know, I've, I created a show that was on at the Royal Court, and this merchant is very much my baby, and I've just written another thing about Mae West. 
And I, you know, I've, I've, I'm lucky because I've always wanted to work. But my mm. dad, who my family had no understanding of this industry, I'm, I'm sure yours didn't. And my dad always used to say to me when I said I wanted to be an actress, he said, quite frankly, Tracy, if you're going to go down this path, you're going to end up living in a bedsit with a cat for the rest of your life. So every day that I'm not doing that, I feel like I'm winning at life. Wow. Um, and I do feel that it was for me, it was always about working. It was never about being famous and it was never, you know, I'd be happy. One for the meal, one for the real is the expression. Yeah, yeah. But for me, the the real, you know, the stuff that really meant something, the soul food work was important. And I think as I've got older, I'm able to do things like the Pinter season and the Harold Pinters, and I've just done Noises Off in the West End, which is oh, done what brilliantly. Was that like? Amazing. Yeah. You, have you ever been in that? No, I've well, you never should have. Be in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Loved it. At the same time, I was doing The Merchant, you know, Friday Night Dinner, Ridley Road. It's a Tell me about of... Friday Night Dinner. Oh. That's a hell of a show as well. Also, with such a strong voice. Such a strong voice. Just, well, just Robert as... Popper's, you know, vision of taking his own family experience, but turning it into a universal experience of two mm. brothers going back every Friday night for dinner and turning back into the teenagers yeah. they were was a joy and um, again I think I came in for one episode and I stayed for seven series <laughs> it was I mean and to work with Paul Ritter yeah. and- Dearly departed, yeah, yeah. Um, and and Tams and Greg and you know and Simon Bird that 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 was an incredible job because it was like family yeah. and you're filming in a tiny little house in Mill Hill where there are only five angles for anyone seen so you'll do a scene in the corridor that is about four pages long that can take nine hours to film so you're mm. stuck together that's and with like Gavin and Stacey but oh, we, I can we were we were in uh, yeah one of the ho- the main house in that was a real size you know normal house so uh, no room no room for anything the my greatest moment was when you told me I did a very good Welsh accent. Let's hear it. You said to me, what is it, like Swansea? I can't remember. That's good. I can do any accent. Can Ready? Do. Northern. Hey, up. New- How, how's that doing, duck? <laughs> Newcastle. Way, hey. <laughs> As going down the fishy for a chippy. Cornish. Oh, we won't catch these fish unless we get out there soon. God, it's unbelievable, isn't it? Isn't I it mean, amazing? It's, oh, it's like the Simpsons. And what I love about it is the texture and, yeah. and the... <laughs> The, the detail yeah. and the kind of light and shade. Yes. Because I don't want them just to be kind of cardboard cut out. Each of those voices is a real person. <laughs> Scottish. Oh, hey, oh, hey, the new. I be going down the ship, yeah, yeah. soon. <laughs> eh. It's like a whole life, isn't it? Yeah. It's like nuance. Yeah, yeah. But I'm doing my hands now. Oh. Yeah. Your parents didn't encourage you. They discouraged you from acting then. I think my dad's words were, don't be a so wanker. F- Actually, don't be a wanker. I mean, who... He, what, I, what did he do then? He was a lawyer. <laughs> But he was a bit, but he was like, you know, they'd come out, you know, we were immigrant family. We'd all yeah. come out of the East End. And yeah. my dad was a bit like, don't be a wanker. Who becomes an actor? It's only children of actors that become actors. You might as well say you want to be an astronaut. Don't be ridiculous. Go and watch Rumpole of the Bailey. <laughs> Go down the law route. It's like acting. You get to wear a funny outfits. That's so interesting. You know, see, I grew up around Port Talbot, where Richard Burton and Anthony Hopkins are from. <laughs> so so it was it was totally in the air that it is possible to not just be an actor, but in the to case of great. Richard Burton, and obviously to be, but, you know, when Burton was the most famous person in the world in the 1960s, and it had happened from there, and then Anthony Hopkins came along. So, so often you hear actors say, oh, where I came from, you know, there, there was there was nobody. It was, But I think Port Albert is kind of unique in the sense that these two, and now Michael Sheen, you know, these two titans... Are from there. So uh, 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 tell me, uh, with Merchant of Venice then, uh, 1936, when does it open? It opens on the 21st of September at the Swan in Stratford-upon-Avon. And it's there for three weeks and it goes on a nationwide tour. And if I was, if I owned a laptop computer <laughs> or a handheld device or mm-hmm. tablet and I wanted to go online, what web address would I be using? The website would be www.merchantofvenice1936.co.uk. Well, I think you've been very clear. Is that clear? Yes. Merchant of Venice, 1936.co.uk. Merchant of Venice, 1936.co.uk. Can you hear me, Clem Fandango? (laughs) No, I think you'll come and I'm going to get you a good seat and I think you're going to like it. A house seat. No, you'll have to pay for it, but I will get you a good you seat. You pay for a house seat, but it's just a nice, oh, like a it's a nice seat. seat yes. Yeah, I mean, it's no big thing because, the, as you know, house seats are always held back. Yes. And they're there. Can we finish this podcast, yes. Tracy Ann? Because I've tried to finish it several oh, times. Oh, so I don't want to go now. It's the never ending episode. It's like a nuclear bomb has gone off outside and oh, we're just recording for Oppenheimer. ourselves. Oppenheimer. Oh, oh, I'm um, going to see that again tonight. Have you seen it? You've seen it once. I've seen you're it gonna, once. I'm going, going back again. Have you seen Barbie? Yes. Oh, 
your starring role in it. Thank you. Did you Finally. do more in it or did it get cut off? A little tiny bit more. I was one, really, one other little scene. Yeah. I was really excited to see. I did what you did to Omid. I went, oh, it's Rob Brydon, <laughs> really loudly to my daughter. And now and that we've brought it back to me, we can end <laughs> the podcast. Yes, I do appear in Barbie as Sugar Daddy Ken, probably still at cinemas. It's quite the hit. Shut up, it's finished. Shut up, Tracy Ann. <sighs> Goodbye.